hopefully time is not the factor or not as much of the factor so that we can truly listen to our patients. Hello everyone, I'm Glenn Faison, Alumni Engagement Director for Torrey University of California in the Office of University Advancement. I'd like you wel to welcome you all to the latest episode of The Current, which is the university's alumni broadcast. Joining me today is Dr. Clipper Young. He's a 2013 graduate of the College of Pharmacy, a member of the College of Osteopathic Medicine's faculty, and also a member of the newly constituted Alumni Association Board of Directors. So Dr. Young, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Glenn, for having me here. Yeah, I appreciate you taking the time. So I'd like to set the stage a little bit for those who don't know you, um, kind of how you got into pharmacy and Turo and, and into the career path that you followed. So what drew you to the PharmD program at Turo University of California? And, and while you're at it, um, what about your time as a, tell us about your time as a student here. Yeah, thanks. So um, for me back then, more than 10 years ago, choosing my career path and Toro stood out as the, the structure of the curriculum. So it was a two, four year program and two plus two. So finding the balance between having two years in class, learn all the things that we need to learn to be functional um, as a student, and then going back out, having another two years to practice and apply, to me, that was super important. And and also location. So all my family is there in North uh, California. Okay. So, so staying close to home um, would be another big factor for me because also I went to UC Davis for undergrad. So I didn't want to move, still move away from home, but not as much that would be so far that my parents wouldn't be too unhappy about that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so you talked a little bit about what aspect of the program you know, drew you here. What, what uh, pieces of the program left the greatest impression on you as you moved through the program? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, going back to the first question, so as a student, looking back, I was pretty vocal about certain things, about how this, the curriculum should be structured, why we're taught this way, not the other way. Um, I think really stem on the, re the, the career path that I want to go into academia. Um, and of course, all of, a lot of the things that I express as a student, of course, is part of it is my opinion, and also I've, I was a class rep. So hearing s my classmates um, wanting to somehow not just improve the quality of our education, but also the quality of, of education from classes after us. So I was just being one of the many voices and hoping through voicing a student's opinion so that I can learn from that. So I was a class rep for two years and also specifically really for curriculum. And also that would be the building block for me to set if I were to become a junior faculty after graduating from Toro, what are the things I need to learn? As simple as communicating with faculty because you don't want people to see you as, oh, you're just somehow um, a communicating in a sense that you want to get what you want, but are you truly looking at a big picture, right? And that would be the big thing for, for anyone really in, in, um, in workplace. And also getting used to academia, really truly working with faculty, and that really taught me what would be the best way to not, not only for communication, and also see the other side. The curriculum was set the way it was, there was a reason. But for us, not knowing enough, um, that we express our opinion, but now really working, communicating with them, I learned the other side. And also learned to see both sides of me being a class rep in the middle, how can, how could I be the voice of the students, but also in a way that can be productive, that the faculty, they were willing to change um, a few things to make our journey uh, a bit smoother. And going back to your second question, what was the biggest impression? I would say it's the caring faculty. Um, back then, many of my mentors really from this school, and I, of course, I kept touch in touch with them, and then now they're my friends. And for example, Dr. McCarter, and um, also Dr. Ellaby, they're not clinicians, but they taught me how to be a caring person, so that later on, how can I be a caring clinician? Um, caring has a lot to do, the first thing is really truly listen. And and listen to my concerns about my personal growth and also 
my opinions and also other students' opinion about the curriculum really taught me looking just like you and I sitting right here, and I would just keep talking and talking and talking, <laughs> and they just listen. They really just listen, and oftentimes maybe write a few things, and that taught me that wow, we have a lot of Korean faculty members here truly wanting to listen and make changes, and I saw the changes even even before my third year going out to rotation. And that really set, um, I would say, the seed of me. Is there a future for me here at Toro? And then two years after, or two years in rotation, and then I applied to my residency or postgrad training, and I didn't apply to residency, I just applied to fellowship. And wanting to get into academia, and, and Toro was the only program that I applied to. Um, thinking that, well, if I didn't get, a tor get into Toro Fellowship Program, then maybe that I should choose another career path. But thank God I got in, <laughs> and that now has been my 10 years um, being um, a, a faculty here. So at some point you made a decision to specialize in diabetes. So tell us about how that happened, and, and in addition to that, you're a College of Pharmacy graduate, and you are faculty in the College of Osteopathic Medicine. So, how did yeah. all that come about? How much time do you have? <laughs> how much a, time do you need? That's a long story, <laughs> in a sense. I would say, going back to my days when I was a kid, so I was born in China, and I came to the U.S. at the age of 13. But growing up in China, I really grew up with my grandparents, and my grandpa had diabetes for so many years. Um, I would say probably 20 to 30 years. And he passed away due to diabetes compli complications, specifically kidney um, failure. So back then in China, my I still remember vividly going to clinic with them at least probably two or three day, two or three times um, a day to get insulin. Because back then there's no technology, there's not even finger prick to get blood. So. When, when the patient wanted to monitor or, or get a feedback of how well the sugar is managed, you really through urine, urine dip, urine strips. So I remember testing that, my own urine, also my, my, my grandpa just wanted to learn about this world, the diabetes world. I'm also going to, to clinic with my, my grandpa to get the short now, going, thinking back the short acting insulin, before his meals. So that was really, uh, I didn't know enough that the intricacy of the pharmacotherapy and all of that, and not even knowing, well, what's the point of checking your urine every day? I didn't know much. But I think that because of that, that's, and seeing my grandpa doing this every day, and also being very careful not to consume too much sugar um, during each meal, that had an impression on me. Uh, but not even that did not truly get... Or for me, I didn't truly think about it until the last year of pharmacy school and really pushing me to, okay, what do I want uh, from here? I've gotten some education, but what what is the future for me from a, uh, from a professional point of view? So and going back to that, that six or seven years living with my grandpa or living with someone who I love and cherish and taught me a lot about life and that really the, really the starting point for me to think about do I want to specialize? If the answer is yes, what would be that area that I want to specialize in? And and then diabetes would be the perfect, the, the first thing that came to my mind. And I had many people ask me, so how did you get into this field or how did you um, find diabetes? And going because of the story, I think that diabetes found me through through my grandpa, and and now, now I've been a, a practitioner, a clinician for ten years, and there's no way that I could have my, my grandpa. But but I really want to help grandpas or grandparents throughout the region that I'm able to, to help, and that's the reason why that I try to engage in professional organizations, diabetes specific, so that I can share a few things that I've learned along the way, and also. Also, because of the exchange, that I also learned things from other healthcare professionals who are way more um, experienced than me, so that that I can continue to to grow not only from books but really from life stories. So, going back to how did I start it in the pharmacy world, but now somehow ended up or continue to learn in the medical world? I think it's one person that changed my life. 
um, completely. He stopped at Shibrook, stopped at J. Shibrook. Um, I still remember meeting him the first time just through a phone call. And at that point, he just first came to, to our school um, from Ohio. Um, I didn't, I just asked to introduce myself and then somehow just, just um, finished the phone call. However, I did a follow-up. So email, and that would be the lesson that I want to share with anyone, networking. Networking in a sense that you somehow share your passion with someone, and then somehow Dr. Shiro, um in diabetes, and that was with the beginning of my journey with the Dream Team and with with um, with Calm, and and also, and I didn't know that that was really a backstory that I think I can share here. Um, after two weeks, just no email from Dr. Shiro after two weeks, and finally um, there's an email, and then I didn't know there was an interview an interview thing, so I just show up um, in, in his office and sort of just being myself a lot. It just we, we chat a lot about um, diabetes and at the point that I just started my training public health through Berkeley. So that was another building block as well. Um, having been trained as a clinician, just a small part of what I knew about the healthcare world and I felt that that was not enough and, and public health really helped me. And I think that Dr. Shu wrote started um, his next chapter of his career at Toro and he was trying to build a team that I didn't know. So, and, and somehow that talking to him for two hours and probably that um, he saw things that maybe that I can contribute to the building of the team and then that was really the, the beginning of me working not with him, not just with him, but really somehow got myself into the osteopathic medical world and I'm still learning because I was trained as a clinical pharmacist and there's a lot of different things that I still need to learn this different culture for example so um, after 10 years I feel like wow there's still a lot that it's not just about learning about diabetes but learning about how to work with um, other healthcare professionals and specifically being in this culture is osteopathic uh, physicians and also physicians in general and that led to the other um, part of our campus, where our campus is, we have PAs, we have nurses, we have public health practitioners, as well as education um, schools. So that also branched my my horizons to the different healthcare professionals, so that I can truly somehow learn how to work with everybody. And that really helped us, or me, in, in specifically, to build a dream team. So in case. Um, if, if not, I don't think that everybody heard of Dream Team. So Dream Team specifically is what we call ourselves the Diabetes Research and Education and Management Team. So it's really a group of very interprofessional um, practitioners and with a passion in diabetes and got into to this space. And it's been, we started 2015 and it's been eight years. And we are still learning things along the way but we have created a structure and, and hopefully we want to to make that uh, difference in specifically local start start with locally, right, in, in Solano County. Um, yeah. Well you touched on a couple of things that I want to follow up on. Yeah. Um, let's start with the Solano County aspect of it. Um, Toro was involved in a uh, diabetes update conference uh, hosted at North Bay Health's Administrative Center in Fairfield. That's been going on for a few years now, correct? Yeah, we started 2016. 2016, yeah. okay. So that just happened the first part of November. Um, why is it so? Why is it important for Toro specifically to be involved in the conference and tell tell our listeners a little bit about the conference since it is specific to Solano County, but I know that it's open to basically anyone who can get there. Sure, sure, yeah. So we started in 2016, and actually this was Dr. Shubrook's idea. Um, so Dr. Shubrook's background was a family uh, physician, and then his passion is really how can he, how can we better educate practitioners and clinicians in specifically the primary care space. So that it just because many patients, their first stopping stop for their diabetes management is probably not the specialist, it's really primary care. So, um, and that's how that the idea came out of, of, of when we are selecting topics or when we are selecting speakers, how can we somehow with that primary care focus? And then, um, so that was the starting point. And going back to why this is so important, it just because we have 
that the, at this, let's, let's go with the Solano County. So we have 9.8% of the Solano County living with diabetes. So that means, um, can the, the healthcare system to serve everybody? The answer is no. So, but then most, most patients, they start with their primary care um, uh, uh, providers or, or clinicians, and then they got referred to us. So we get to see, okay, what are the needs, what are the, the gaps for improvement, and that was oftentimes became the talks, became the topics of what we can somehow help, help uh, the primary care clinicians to be more confident in the care that they deliver to, to um, their patients. So, and then slowly things evolve from, um, the thing about really finding a balance between what is the, cool, the coolest thing and the newest thing in the field, and also what would be the, the guidelines. Going back to, to uh, clinicians, so diabetes guideline, guideline updates every year. So um, every year you get a, now it's like more than 200 pages, from ADA, American Diabetes Association. It's really daunting to read that guidelines. So, and then, but then we still need to keep up with the newest research and what is the newest recommendation that we need and we need to implement in our care. So that was actually um, one of the things that we want to focus on is what is the most important thing for our clinicians to know based on the newest research and also the newest guidance so that we can practice with the newest evidence. And also how can we bring in some cool topics like precision medicines or AI. AI has become, it's, I would see, it's the future of, of many things and, and healthcare included. So then what are the important things that the clinician might want to know in terms of enriching everybody's practice? And also microbiome has been a hot topic in this space as well that we probably don't hear enough in my opinion and that would really be the building blocks for us to introduce that into our conference. And also um, because of we have done this for more than five years, put it that way, and then we also think that, well, in order to branch out, are there other opportunities that we can partner with other organizations so that um, the conference is not just one day, it could be two days, three days, that would be in the future, um, if we can get to three days. So that we saw the opportunity to partner with ADCS, so it's Association of Diabetes Scan Education Specialists. So we started this year that the Saturday um, event was sponsored by ADCS and then the, the Sunday event is tutorial. But then we have two days of time to somehow cover as many topics as possible. So that, that because of the opportunity, we had um, a block of lectures or presentations on diets because that would be another important thing that we want to relay and bring it back to our practice. So that we would not have been able to do that if it were just one day event. So you're clearly involved with ADCES as evidenced by the partnership in the, the latest uh, program at North Bay. Um, you also have been recognized both nationally and at the state level. In 2018, you received the National Organization's Rising Star Award, and in 2022, the Diabetes Impact Award from the California chapter of the association. Um, so why don't you, let's start with the most recent award. Tell us about uh, the work that led to the Diabetes Impact Award in 2022. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, I wouldn't say that that was my award. I think that it's really the team, and then okay. I would just fortunate enough that pe that I represent a team um, to, to have that recognition. So this most recent one in 2022, uh, 2021, um, the big thing is really the platform, I would say the platform that we have built in the past eight years that led to a few community programs because this specifically is the impact. So um, on the application, I mentioned two things, really the MOVAC program, so Mobile Diabetes Education Center, that is really a team effort. That we go out every week to screen for those who might have diabetes and pre-diabetes and maybe hypertension. And then later on, we are adding um, cholesterol screening as well. So that would be one of the building blocks. Um, and then secondly, it's really um, the, the later effort that our, our team built was farm to home. So farm to home, so me being trained as a clinical pharmacist, is really thinking, well, how can we truly bring um, clinical services beyond the walls of the clinic? Oftentimes it's not enough for patients, right? The, the current 
uh, healthcare model is you get 15 minutes with a clinician and then anything more than that, good luck with that. You <laughs> have to come back next time or you somehow probably not getting the enough attention that they deserve. And, and there are, this is a different topic, but we need, <laughs> this, this is, we need the, the, the background of why we started with the Fonty Home so that we bring the care to their home through telehealth and home visits. And hopefully, time is not the factor or not as much of the factor so that we can truly listen to our patients and listen to what their needs are and most importantly their challenges at home and we also get to see the environment that we learn a lot about why they behave a certain way and when patients they get into the clinic they present what they want to present to us we oftentimes do not even get probably not even 10 percent or 50 percent of the full picture and that would be very difficult when it comes down to chronic disease management so um, and and with these two programs and also I would say what's important is really support from the team has a lot to do with start with we have done so much but the most important thing is how do we show that or how do we put in a story so that that the outside world might not know as much that we can share with them our journey. So that has a lot to do with evaluation, numbers, outcome measures, and lo a lot of that. And thanks to um, our, our team putting together the numbers and also to my training, going back to, to my training, um, being a public health practitioner, because being a clinician, you focus on certain things. And then when it comes down to truly managing programs, you think a different way. So, um, and, and with a lot of really team effort, putting together reports, um, and also looking at, at the other building blocks that I would like to add would be the research that Dr. Shubrook started a team on doing different levels of research for clinical trials um, with um, uh, the, the connection with the industry and also how what uh, the research questions or our passion in diabetes, and we have our own questions in type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes, and also writing a lot of review papers with students because they are the future um, of, of healthcare, of those who are interested, then they somehow do the work with us so that we can share with them if you want to develop some kind of, of research paper or review paper, and that is how we do it. And that is, I think, I would like to think that that is probably the impact and really impact is multiple levels. It's how much that we're impacting the community and also how much we're impacting the people that we serve. And I hope that that would be, I don't want to use the term patients, but participants, because a lot of them, they're not our patients, but our community. And also um, being in academia is really our, our students and, and how willing they are to, to somehow to continue um, with their journey. Um, I, I feel like we are the ones showing them what can be done. So, I mean, this sounds like the, you know, you see it in old TV and movies and stuff, the, 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 the town doctor coming to the home and, you know, somebody's sick and they're, they're taking care of you in your home. Uh, this sounds like a throwback to that type of situation where you as a clinician or, or your partner's clinicians or public health people are coming into people's homes. So if I'm, if, you know, I, I'm a resident of Solano County, how does somebody plug into that? Yeah, yeah. So, so step one is, so thanks to the partnership with Solano County Family Health Services, so I would say most of our participants in front to home, um, they are being referred by the primary care clinicians as okay. well as the pathologists, specifically Dr. Schubert and Dr. Matt. So they are the one um, referring the patients to us. So we do have a connection that just one thing is healthcare, it's a team effort. It's really a team sport. So I feel like the platform that we're able to create and also partner with the outside world is really we're creating a team. And, and for us, our goal is really to connect the dots, not just for the patients, but also for the clinicians. Because clinicians, most of the, the primary care providers and, and the, the diabetologists, they don't, they don't do home visits. But it will be helpful that with the information that we're able to collect when we're doing home visits, going feedback to them so that when they're making decisions with the patients, um, so that we can make a more comprehensive co um, recommendations with them so that they will not feel like, oh, you're telling me what to do. And we try not to do that. Um, 
but that in order to avoid that kind of practice, we truly need to get to know our patients. And, and the time is really the most important factor. And also, for, for me, in the, the ID world, I'm really hoping to practice um, combining humanity and science. So humanity, what, how can we do that is really listen to our patients and, and create time. I know that time is really a luxury. Um, in, in, in the how we need to, to practice. But then we need to just create additional um, opportunities so that time wouldn't be that, that big of a factor. And going back to the question that you asked earlier, um, conferences would be a way to share the, the science, the, the newest thing in the field, so that we can meet the needs of our patients. All right. Um, so there was also the National Rising Star Award. If you could briefly um, kind of summarize yeah. the work that led to that. Yeah, I, I would say that that is really the early, early, earlier stage of what I just mentioned. Okay. So back then, so um, the Rising Star was back in 2018. So most of the work was really done through MOBAC and then also research and managing. And I think it's really the interprofessional team. Um, that I'm, I'm so fortunate to be a part of. So that not only that at the local level that we get the recognition, but also the national level. And that really tells me that at that national level, many people, they do cherish um, team-based care. And then but the most important thing is how can we make it work? And when we make it work, how do we capture the outcomes of that so that that we can continue to grow. And also later on, coming back to the practical practical um, point, it's we need to get grants to set that our many of our programs and it's really funded by many of our, our funders in the community so that, that in order to have that outcomes so that we can show the work that we're doing, not only is meaningful, but also it's effective to serve the needs of our patient population. You're involved with the national organization, correct? Didn't you just come back from Chicago? Mm -hmm. Why don't you tell us about that trip? Yeah, so um, also that I'm very fortunate to, to be included or elected into the national board of directors um, for the organization. And one of the many duties is really attending the board meeting four times a, four times a year. So, and then I just came back November, it's always January, um, April, um, August and November. So that would be also another networking opportunity um, to get to know what is the newest, but really learn it for me personally, learning about the business side of healthcare, because I was trained as a clinician and later on as a public health practitioner, not the business mindset, at least that I didn't have that a year ago. And I wouldn't say that I have a lot now, having been on the board for a year, but that truly inspired me to look more into it. It's if we want programs to be sustainable, we need to think about the business aspect because we're talking about the long term. And, and being in that role and being um, uh, included in that environment truly inspired me to learn about, um, now I'm thinking, I don't know how far I can go with that idea, but <laughs> going back to school and thinking about M uh, MBA, um, so that would probably another 10 years from now, hopefully I can get some training, and be truly the business aspect and then getting, getting the reimbursement for the work that we do so that we can continue to build the infrastructure or the platform that we have created this far. Well, I think that's about it for our time today. Um, Dr. Young, I want to thank you again for joining us. And to our listeners, thank you for tuning in. Until next time, take care, everyone. Thank you.